this video is going to talk about the do loop statement in Visual Basic, which is one of the implementations of the repetition structure in the language, along with a couple other very closely related topics to the do loop. Um, we're going to cover all of these sections in the textbook, 5.2, 5.3, 5.4, and 5.5 .5 in the focus on the concepts part, as well as um, A5.1. Uh, just a little bit of covering that we're sort of glancing over it, but of course with any of the apply the concepts sections you should check it out in more detail for yourself for better practice. Now the syntax for the do loop, the pretest version of it in this case, is going to be um, starting by saying do, and then you put either while or until, depending on whether you want to use a looping or loop exit condition, and then you actually put your condition, which is any Boolean expression that hopefully you would expect to change in the statement body. So. For example, if you were using the uh, pretest version of the, um, the looping condition that we talked about in the last video, it would be do while int num is less than or equal to five. The loop exit version would be do until int num is greater than five. And then of course we have the loop body that is processed either uh, while the condition is true, if you choose while, or until the condition is true, if you choose until. And then you end it with loop, sort of like how you end your if statements with end if. All right, so what I actually have here is the code for this um, counting application that we showed off in the last video, the pseudocode for. So this is actually the implementation of that, um, that actual pseudocode, specifically these lines right here. This is line one that I was talking about, uh, declaring the variable. Line two was the condition. Uh, line three was putting the value in the label. Line four was uh, incrementing int num. Incrementing, by the way, means adding some consistent value that you will keep on adding over and over and over again, usually one in this case. Um, so int num plus equals one is incrementing it uh, to the next number. And then you loop back up to the top. Once this condition is false, we actually end the um, subroutine right there. Uh, this part right here, I will explain more in actually just a second, but know that it is essentially sticking these two strings next to each other. So whatever is currently in the labels text property with the string that we get by converting int num to a string. So when I run it, uh, we would expect uh, label nums to have the numbers one, two, three, four, five, all right next to each other, just like this, where if I click display to run our sub our procedure, we get one, two, three, four, five, all right next to each other. Isn't that pretty nifty? Now what I want to do is actually run that edge case that I had before where I started at six. Um, so I'll build the application again. Uh, int num starts at six, which means that the condition fails immediately and nothing actually happens when I click display because we never enter our while loop, which means that we never actually modify the dot text property. So it will always be empty. And to show that it's not frozen, I can click exit and the application exits just fine. It's just that we never enter this while loop. So the um, display never actually gets properly updated. All right, so now what I'll do is I'll start it at one again, but let's actually move int num plus equals one and put it above label nums dot text and see what happens. So it's building, it's building. We know that we'll enter the while loop this time, but instead we're starting with two, three, four, five, six, because 
we enter with int num being at one, but then we add one to it and then display it. So the location of where you actually increment whatever um, variable it you're controlling that is uh, you know part of the condition for the while loop, where you do that is really important. And typically you're going to see that happen at the very bottom rather than at the very top. Although it depends on how you set up your code, how you end up liking to do things. For example, you could start this at zero to get the same effect. But then you run into some trouble, right? So it doesn't actually really work that way. You want to put int num plus equals one specifically at the bottom like so, and it runs perfectly when you do that. And then one more fun experiment. Let's actually start uh, int num at five. And let's say we want to count down to one. So five, four, three, two, one. Now, what we do know is that int num should be decreasing, right? We start at five. Uh, and then we go down to four, then three, then two, then one. But we want to stop at one, right? You know, we want one to be the last one that gets shown, which means that we need to say, you know, while the next number that I want to print is greater than or equal to one. We're starting at five, we're going down, and we want to add it to the label while that next number is greater than or equal to one. As soon as that number is less than one at zero, then we know that we want to stop. So we can say that while it's greater than or equal to one, we'll display it and then we'll subtract one from int num. Well, so we'll decrement it in this case, decrement it or however you want to say it, but we're removing one from it. So when we actually build it, we'll see that we start at five and then we're going down four, three, two, one. And it doesn't have to be by just one as well. We could do it by any number. Uh, we could decrease it by two, for example. And then we have five, three, one. Uh, it knows to stop a one because the next value would be negative one. And it says, well, I don't want to print negative one because negative one is less than one. So I won't print that at all. So those are just some fun ways that we can play around with the while loop here. Now, remember that this condition right here can be any Boolean value. So it doesn't just have to be a comparison. It can really be anything. You can have, um, you know, the logical operators in play. You can have Boolean variables in play, all that kind of stuff. Now, what I can do is um, I'm going to just for the sake of example right here, I'm going to make this ridiculously inefficient um, where, you know, you don't have to do this. There are much more efficient ways of doing this using just regular comparisons and all that kind of stuff. But I'm just going to do this for the sake of example. So let's say what I wanted to do is use some sort of Boolean variable to let me know when the program is too, uh, when, sorry, when int num is too large. So dim uh, boolean is too large. Uh, and we'll start out at false because we expect um, one to be smaller than five. We're expecting to actually go through at least once, right? So I'll start that out as false. What I'll do is while it is not too large, so what that means is while not boolean is too large, well, while this is false, while the negation is true, uh, you know, print the text, add one to int num, and then if int num is too large, then I actually flip boolean is too large to be true, which means the negation is false, which means that the while loop exits. And I'll use this if statement right here. Um, oh, mistyped my Boolean variable right here. That's what I get for coding on camera. 
but if int num is now greater than five after being incremented, so we print five, it becomes six. If it is six is greater than five, then we flip this to true. Uh, this negation is false. We get out of there. You can hopefully see why you wouldn't want to do this in the first place because of the fact that, you know, I might as well just use the comparison, do it while it's small enough. But again, it's it's simply for the sake of doing some crazy example here. So I'll run it. Uh, no, I will not. I will evaluate the builders very quickly. Be right back. All right, what happened here is it's giving me some error about Boolean is too large as object. It means that I forgot to put the data type. Again, this is what I get for coding on camera. It is never something that works very well. But now I have this uh, properly defined as a Boolean. When I display it, everything will work just fine. But of course, this is very redundant. All I'm doing is checking if int num is greater than five and then doing an action that will get me out of the loop, right? So why not just kind of eliminate all this mess and make it a lot simpler? Why don't I just, while I'm already, you know, checking for int num being greater than five here, convert this to a do until loop and num is greater than five and then i can get rid of this all of that and i can even get rid of this boolean variable there so now i have seamlessly minus a couple of build errors transfer uh transformed this into a do until loop if we build it and we run it I don't know why I keep on building this on camera. I'm always running a risk of embarrassing myself, but here I go. It, you know, it works great. So beautiful. And the last thing I'll show off is how to do this do until with a decreasing um, count, countdown. So starting at five, going five, four, three, two, one, like I showed before, I'll start at five right here. I'm going to subtract one from it um, if I leave it like this, it's going to be bad, and I'll show you why it would be bad soon. But what I want to do is I want to stop when int num is less than 1. I want to keep going while it's greater than or equal to 1. I want to stop while it's less than 1, so I can do until int num is less than 1. Or I could even do, because it's an integer, integer less than or equal to 0. But I'm always partial to less than 1, because simply it is 1 less character to type. Uh, I'm going to risk embarrassing myself with a build error again, which surely will not happen. And it works beautifully. So that is an example of doing that decrease with the do until loop. Now I did kind of go past this use of the ampersand right here, this and symbol between two strings. Uh, this is where I actually start talking about it. So um, I'm going to talk about what's known as string concatenation. You use that ampersand. It's an operator, just like the plus or minus or um, logical or, or not or any of those, right? It's an operator. It has two strings and it gives one string back out. In this case, it sort of quote unquote adds the two strings together by sort of smashing them next to each other, like what we saw with the label text, how it smashed one and then smashed two next to one and then three next to two and then four next to three and then five next to four and all that kind of stuff. So we're concatenating the strings. We're adding the second string to the end of the first and we're trading that, like we're making one entirely new string out of all of that. Now, it doesn't look great for visual and basic to be smashed together with no spaces in between, especially if we we're trying to work with maybe some kind of message that we're trying to create dynamically by smashing strings together. So if we want to actually insert a space in between visual and basic, there's a couple of different ways we can do that. 
uh, for example, we can put the space after visual. It might be a little hard to see, but this says visual space. And then we put the ampersand right here and then basic. And this gives us visual space basic because the space was already in the first string. So we're putting basic, butting that up against the space. That's kind of giving us a buffer there. We get visual space basic, which looks very nice. Similarly, we can have visual and uh, space basic. So putting the space before basic and we'll get the same result. We can also do visual and space and basic. So space being its own string right here. Uh, and that will give us visual basic as well. Um, I believe it is evaluated left to right. So this would become visual space and basic, and then it becomes visual space basic, just like that. Now we also have some interesting behavior with the empty string, which is important because when you have something like a label, the label's text property contains the empty string immediately which is why we were able to put one in there in the first place without running into any weird errors is because we concatenated the empty string with the value of int num dot two string. So this is what happens when you concatenate the empty string with something on the right side, in this case, visual, you get visual, you get whatever string was on the right side of the ampersand, the string concatenation operator. Similarly, if you do uh, the string containing basic concatenated with the empty string on the right side, it's the same thing. It just gives you the string on the left this time. Uh, so concatenating anything with the empty string gives you that original string on the left and concatenating anything with some, sorry, if concatenating the empty string with some non-empty string on the right gives you just the right string not changed whatsoever. Uh, so here are some more examples of string concatenation. In this case, we're actually getting into concatenation using variables right here. So sort of following the same rules that I was using, but um, whereas before I was able to put a space up here next to visual or before basic, right? When we're working with variables, we can't actually guarantee, especially if we've taken user input and then trimmed it, right? We can't guarantee that there will be spaces there. And we don't really want to, because what if there's a space, uh, in this case, at the end of Atlanta, but before Georgia, and then we have two spaces between it and everything is bad. So we want to trim all of these and then insert our spaces like this using a series of concatenation operations with a space in between. And even better, we can put a comma space to have this nice look right here, Atlanta comma space Georgia, just like that. And then some more uh, complicated combination of strings. She lives in Atlanta with a period at the end. Um, you know, you have the string of she lives in space at the end of that. And then the variable with the string and then a period at the very end, all being concatenated together to give us this really nice look. We also have a great um, example of the two string methods uh, formatting specifiers being super useful because without these formatting specifiers, we'd have to do things like insert the dollar sign and maybe try to figure out how to get the comma in there. But using these specifiers, it handles all of that for us. And we just have to worry about putting the colon and then the space before the thing that says variable or that has the variable. So when you're working with concatenating strings like this, it's really important to make sure that you're accounting for all of your formatting. You don't want to leave things kind of smashed together like this. If it said, if this said right here, she lives in Atlanta, but there's no space between in and Atlanta, that would look really ugly. You want to make those messages look really nice. So keep track of your spaces, make sure that you're putting them in if necessary, even just concatenate the space in between two variables like this, and that'll be really helpful. And then of course, if you want to put things on a new line as if 
you had pressed the enter key after typing out Atlanta before typing Georgia, for example, you can use control chars dot new line, which is a string that contains a special character that tells Visual Basic to move all of the following text onto the next line, as if you pressed enter right there. So that's really helpful. Make sure you remember to use control chars dot new line. There's also a concatenation assignment operator which works like the arithmetic assignment operators that we talked about before, where this one, uh, you just put the ampersand equals, and this uh, label nums.txt equals int num.toString and a space at the very end. All of this is equivalent to saying label nums.txt equals label nums.txt and int num.toString and the space at the very end. So let's take a look at what that looks like in Visual Basic. All right, so remember that this code right here um, sort of formatted everything just like this. All the numbers are smashed together, uh, which is a little bit ugly. So if we want to actually space the numbers out, we can do what we talked about in the previous slides where I just put the ampersand and then a space, the string containing just the space right here. And what that does is when int num equals one, uh, label nums.txt is going to get one with a space after it, which means that in the next round, when we add two and a space after it to the existing text, when we concatenate them together, we get one space, two space, and so on and so forth. Uh, so when this actually builds, now we see that there are spaces in between all of these numbers. And there's also a hidden space after the five. We just don't see it because there's any, there's nothing after it. But I could uh, show off that space by uh, concatenating one more um, string to it. So, and here I'm going to actually use the concatenation assignment operator. And I'm just going to put the string containing end right at the very end. So now, you can see the space that shows up after the five. Note that there's no space before end. That space only shows up because of this space right here when five gets entered into label nums.txt. And of course, I can use this concatenation assignment operator. And it should look exactly the same and it looks exactly the same. Now before, when I was trying to do the counting down instead of counting up example, right? I changed int num to start at five, and I changed int num to decrease by one instead of increase by one. And then I also had to change the condition so that the while loop knew how to stop because, you know, if I leave it like this, well, five is less than or equal to five, and four is less than or equal to five, and three is less than or equal to five, right? And two, and one, and zero, and negative one, and so on and so forth. So what happens if I forget to update this to say, hey, stop it when we hit one? What happens if it just keeps on going? Well, I'm going to run this. And I'm going to run the procedure and we'll see what happens. Uh, I, I'm, going, I'm going to run. No. Well, that, you know, the exit bot button also doesn't work anymore. Um, what's with all this process memory too? That's weird. I mean, it's just completely stopped responding. I, I can't even close the application. That's not great. The reason why I can't do all of this is because int num keeps on decreasing. It starts at a five and then goes to four, three, two, one, zero, negative one, negative two, and so on and so forth. 
it keeps on decreasing and decreasing and decreasing and decreasing and all that kind of stuff. And the program is trying to wait for it to become larger than five so that it can stop running the loop. But it's decreasing. It's never going to be larger than five because it constantly goes down. This is a classic example of what we call an infinite loop. And the reason why we get an infinite loop is always because your condition is never going to turn false for a while loop or true for an until loop. If it will never become false or true, but I I'm going to focus on while right now. If this will never become false, then the program will just keep on running over and over and over again. It doesn't know that it's supposed to stop at this point because clearly something's wrong. It doesn't know that because it assumes, oh, well, I'm just doing something really important that's taking a very long time. It puts complete trust in you. So it doesn't know that it needs to terminate. Which is good, you know, if we have a very, very long operation, we don't want the computer to assume, hey, uh, something's wrong here and just shut it off mid-operation and destroy all of your calculations or something like that. But on the downside, that means that this will run forever. So the first step to figuring out what's going on is we hit stop. And that will stop processing everything in this loop. The next thing we need to do is we need to check the condition. We're doing something while int num is less than or equal to five. In this case, int num is the only, um, the only condition, you know, the, the only variable involved in this condition. So we only really need to check int num. So we should look at what int num starts as and what is happening to int num as we're going through the loop. Now, in this case, what we know is that it's starting at five and it's going down. So we're counting down right here, but our condition assumes that we're counting up. So we can either change the direction that we're counting, one, two, three, four, five, instead of five, four, three, two, one, which means starting it at one and stopping it at five and increasing it or we need to change what the condition is so that it stops when it reaches something that's less than the starting value since it's decreasing. So it's sort of a, uh, a whole interaction between the fact that we're checking an upper bound because this condition assumes that int num is going up and the fact that we're decreasing, which means int num is going down. We could fix this by saying it's less than or equal, you know, changing this less than or equal to five to uh, greater than zero or something like that, right? Like giving it a lower bound instead of an upper bound, or we could say, um, do some kind of logical operator, like while int num is less than or equal to five um, and int num is greater than zero, which would also fix it because as soon as this becomes zero, then this second part fails, and then we know that uh, the whole thing is going to fail. And of course, we should be using and also for good effect. So that would fix this example right here. You kind of have to um, debug these types of errors, these infinite loops on a case-by-case -case basis. You need to know what you're trying to do in order to actually fully debug this. So I'm trying to count down and display all those numbers right here, which means that I need to fix the condition, not the starting value or the, um, you know, the actual decreasing. If I was trying to count up, then I should change the, you know, the decreasing to increasing, decrementing to incrementing. And of course, this should probably start at one as well. All right, so I've done some evil things to this uh, pr this whole procedure, really. Um, I'll try to run through it real quick. So I've added a second integer, int blah, um, 
the, the uh, condition is now while int blah is less than or equal to five, it does start out as zero. That's the default value for an integer. Inside of here, um, I'm actually uh, making int num. Uh, I'm in multiplying it by two and then saving the value back into int num rather than incrementing it by one. Uh, so I'm doing sort of an ex exponential increase of int num, sort of like if I wanted to look at some powers of two or something like that. Now, notice that int blah is not changed whatsoever. Um, you know, it starts at zero, it always is zero, which means that it will always be less than or equal to five, which means that this while loop will happen forever. But I want to show off something really cool that happens. Um, we hit start, and then hit display. It won't take long. There we go. You get the system.overflow exception. Arithmetic operation resulted in an overflow. So what this means, if you ever tried to uh, fill up a cup with water and you pour too much water in, and it kind of spills over the top, because the cup can only contain a certain amount of water, you can't put more in, it'll just kind of fall off the top or something like that. We can kind of think of integers like that, really all values like that. Remember how memory locations only had a certain amount of space that they could hold things in? Well, that set amount of space means that integers can only be so large because they have to be represented, representable by the amount of space that's actually contained within the um, memory location that holds the integer. So there's a maximum value. That's why we have that maximum value that we talked about um, previously, which was 2,147,483, no, I'm sorry, 2,147,483,640. Seven and an integer cannot get any larger than that. Uh, if it tried to get larger than that, well, it, it it's more complicated because if I if I click this view details thing, um, it actually starts out at like one million something. Funny enough, in the last loop of the int num before we get this overflow exception, and we try to multiply it by two. And we end up with, I don't know if you can see the result because Microsoft uh, did not make this font very big, but this result is negative 2 billion, 146,230, sorry, negative 2 billion, 146 million, 233,066. We multiply 1 billion something by two and we get negative 2 billion. It's a fun quirk of uh, numbers and programming because of the way that we actually store numbers as binary data and we kind of chop off any of the results that like any of the pieces of the number that are too large and also a funny figment of the way that we store numbers in binary so that we can represent them as negative or positive. All of this kind of combines together to become the fact that uh, when you overflow, you actually get a smaller number normally. However, you know, we've overflowed right here. We tried to multiply 1 billion something by 2, and we got a number that was smaller than 1 billion. So uh, Visual Basic notices this and says, hey, this overflowed. It became a negative number again. You tried to get put too large of a number into an integer space and it became negative and everything's gone wrong. So you're trying to work with numbers that are too big. So that is something you can risk. Now, the reason why I said times equals two is because I'm impatient and I wanted it to happen really fast. Uh, you could have this happen if you did plus equals one and it would just go up and up and up and up and up and up forever. It might take a while to get there though and I didn't feel like waiting so that's why I made it happen so fast but the reason why you're getting a system overflow exception most likely is 
your condition is bad. For whatever reason, either your condition itself needs to be changed or some variable needs to be updated in order for your condition to change. You can see actually right here, if, if you're able to see the small text, I have a pop-up that says int blog currently holds zero as opposed to int num, which currently holds 1,073,741,824. So int blah either needs to start changing, it needs to start increasing, or int num needs to be somehow involved in this while loop. So when you get something like this happening, um, you can view the details if you want. It may not be the most helpful. You can show the call stack if you want. Probably won't be helpful at all either, to be honest. Um, unless I'm asking you to do something. I guess actually if you're stuck and you can't figure it out, if you get a um, exception like this, you can hit copy details and send that in an email to me. That'll be really helpful. Regardless, when you get an overflow like this, that probably is signaling that you have an infinite loop. So you can just stop it by pressing the stop button up here and then fix it. Uh, we can do a quick and dirty fix by saying int blah plus equals one. And look at that, we have all these lovely powers of two. If we wanted to do the same thing with only one variable, by the way, we could uh, actually start. Um, we're doing the powers of two from one to 32. So we start int num at zero. And what we add to label nums.txt is two to the power of int num and then dot two string. This equals one, get rid of int blah. Uh, oh, and this should be int num. All right, let's hope I didn't make a fool of myself in this long take because I will not be doing another take. Oh, it worked, awesome. So yeah, another example of what can happen with an infinite loop there. Now, another uh, way you can get an infinite loop is by having something that is always true in your while condition or always false in your until condition. Um, so for example, if I did or else, int num is less than or equal to five or else int num is greater than five. One of these is always going to be true. Or even um, here. Let's say I was trying to compensate for both increasing int num and decreasing int num at the same time. Um, and I tried to do that kind of condition. Well, that would be the wrong thing, to, wrong way to do it because I'm doing an or else statement right here. So I'm saying uh, while int num is less than or equal to five or else int num is greater than or equal to zero. Well, the thing is, is that any number that I pick will always be less than or equal to five or greater than or equal to zero. So this will always be true. You could give me any number. It will always satisfy at least one of these. So when I start it, display, we get an infinite loop. See, I can't click exit right now. We're in an infinite loop. Um, and of course, infinite loop is kind of a uh, misnomer. It's practically infinite, but what, like what I showed before with that overflow error, eventually it will stop. It might just take a very, very long time. So we don't have that kind of time. It's practically infinite. Uh, with an until, right, uh, I can do a statement that will always be false. So do until int num is greater than five uh, and also int num is less than zero. I'm using those De Morgan's laws that uh, I showed off previously. We display, nothing happens. Well, uh, infinite loop right there. So, with an until loop, if you have a condition that's always false, 
whether it's because you're not updating something or because you made a condition that will always be false no matter what the uh, various variable values are. Or, you know, while loop is the same thing, but for true. But any of those cases will give you an infinite loop. And in that case, you have to make sure you're properly updating your variable, that you've properly set a good starting value for any of your variables that are involved in your conditions, and that your conditions are working well. You might want to test them out by hand with some values like, you know, the value you start at or the value you want to end at or some values in the middle or values like below where you want to start, above where you want to end, assuming you're increasing, for example, like all that kind of stuff. You want to test out a few different things, maybe on pen and paper as you're building your condition, as you're, you know, writing your pseudocode or making your flowchart or something before actually coding everything and then possibly getting flummoxed by these infinite loops. All right. So now after all of that, we're moving into the post test loops, which should be pretty simple. Um, now that we have all the knowledge and me showing examples off from the pretest loops, right? So you start with do, and then you have your loop body, which is processed either while the condition is true or until the condition is true. You know, while the until condition is false. But you say do, and then you have a loop body, and then loop while condition, or loop until condition, where condition is a Boolean expression. All right, so we have the uh, post-test version of this code right here with our loop while and num is less than or equal to five. Um, you know, all the stuff with infinite loops and all that kind of stuff is still going to apply to here. So I'm not really going to show all of those off, but I'll show off what it looks like for me to mess around with this loop a little bit. So I'll start it. And display, and it displays one, two, three, four, five, just as we would expect. Um, and of course, if I switch the positions of these and then run it, we have two, three, four, five, six, you know, all that kind of stuff as you might expect it. Um, but now if I start uh, int num as five, um, no, as six, let's say, I started here. We get six displayed because this is run at least once and then it says, oh, I shouldn't be running anymore. And then it stops. So rather than skipping it completely, it runs at least once. So that's a big difference here is that if let's say this int num was a user defined value. They enter it in a text box and we uh, have written a program that starts at whatever number that is and then uh, start counting until we reach five. Well, if they type in six and we started counting until they reached five, um, that would be bad. So of course we would want to skip it completely if they put in six. Using a post test loop in this case would be incorrect because you type, you would give out six and then nothing else. And they're saying, hey, I thought this was supposed to ignore numbers that are greater than five because it's supposed to only count up until it reaches five. So that um, is not the best place to put a post test loop. However, a post test loop is great if you know that it will happen at least once. Um, if you can 100% guarantee that loop will run at least once, post test loops are fantastic. Uh, that's, you know, one less check you have to do, and it might just make more sense to think about it in terms of a post-test loop. Really, functionally, pre-test and post-test loops are very similar, as well as, like, the difference between looping and loop exit conditions. They're all very similar. It's all about what makes sense to you as a programmer when you're actually writing all of this stuff out. It's, it's all there for convenience. And of course, I'll very quickly show the until. So loop until int num is greater than five. And we'll start, start the debugger and run. And it works 
exactly the same. So that is all of the post-test stuff. All right, well, I know there's a lot of material covered in there, but this is how we implement most of our loops in Visual Basic. It's a very, very useful programming tool for us to be able to repeat statements over and over and over again, rather than just having to uh, type out the same statements over and over and over again in code. So I hope that this visual with this video with all of those examples that I was showing off is really helpful.